Coffee, Cows, and Crops is produced by the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association and hosted by Extension Coordinator Johanna Murray. On this podcast, we discuss management practices and research results with scientists, ranchers, researchers, and farmers. We strive to share innovative information and farming practices supported by sound science and practical wisdom. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get learning. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Coffee, Cows, and Crops. On today's episode, we're chatting with Avery Shepard, a bison producer and imperial seed rep from Saskatchewan. And we'll be chatting about raising bison, getting into cover crops, and all that fun stuff. But before we get into that, Avery, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your farm and how you got started with bison? Sure. Uh, First of all, thanks for the opportunity to speak on your podcast. Um, So I got into raising bison I guess when at a very young age my dad was fortunate to fulfill a dream for me I always wanted bison and uh, we got our first bison in 96 and we just maintained uh, a small herd of 20 to 30 animals until about 12 years ago when I acquired my own land enough that I could start expanding on my own and took over a little bison herd that we had together Um, and since then I've taken things quite seriously I'm just a cow calf producer um, actually, in the drought in 21, I started back running my heifers just for a drought management plan. Um, yeah, and I guess I've gotten fairly involved. I'm the president of the Saskatchewan Bison Association as well. So, Right on. So cover crops are a fairly new addition to your management system. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what convinced you to try them, what sort of cover crops you're using, all that fun stuff? Sure. When I got into cover cropping, I guess originally it was started looking at my land that I had just purchased and wasn't real happy with the future, how the future looked for me. I could see very degraded land. I had no soil on the hilltops and I'm in the gray wooded soil zone. So I didn't start with very much soil. Mm -hmm. Um, I can see good farmland from my hilltops, but I don't farm any of it. So just seeing that, I thought there was, I needed to change something on my farm. So I started researching uh, looking into what I could do. I heard a little bit about cover crops and carbon was a little bit of a topic back then as well. So I started researching carbon, which led me into Gabe Brown and Dave Brandt and Colin Zeiss and names like that. And I uh, just studied what they were doing and decided I was going to start growing cover crops. And about the same time, my neighbor started selling for another company and I put my first cover crop in that spring and just went from there. And yeah, I was pretty fortunate too having that other neighbor that started at the same time so we could share experiences and and uh difficulties that we were having together because it's not all it's not all fun and games. There's mistakes to be to be made in cover cropping as well. So <laughs> so I guess the one big thing too when I was looking at my land, one of the fields I bought, uh the old guy I bought it from had mentioned it was one of the first fields broke in this country, and this was all originally forest land. And when I first took over that land, it was in hay and we took it out and we cropped it for three years. Um, still using old machinery, so it was a pull type combine and we combined it, bailed it, and removed everything for them three years. And then it went back into hay. And on the second year, you could see where them chaff strips were. So just that little bit of chaff residue being left behind was making quite a difference to the to the next crop. And when I saw that, I thought, well, I've got to start leaving a lot of a lot of residue on my land and uh, try and do things better and then swath grazing combined with cover crops just really accelerated things uh, the first field I started on within two years I could see every year I do fertility tests on my land because they say with cover crops you can reduce your fertility so I do my own tests on my land just doing simple check strips where I do 50 percent of what I normally put and I'll have a zero check strip and mark them off um, and by year two, you could hardly see it. And by year three, I couldn't even see my zero check strip anymore. So at that point, I knew I was going in the right direction and that I wasn't going to go back to, to the old way of farming. Um, and the water started going in the ground as well. I had one rain event where we got two and a half inches of rain and that's a real pothole filled field and, uh, had very little water in them, in them fields. And then I went to another field a quarter mile away that I hadn't been working on in the Water was still running off the field and the sloughs were filling up. And I thought, oh, this is, it's amazing what can happen in a very short period of time. So it's really, really opened my eyes, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So as you've been getting more experienced with cover crops, have your goals for the ground changed or have the crops changed to fit your goals? Yes, my goals have definitely changed. And 
I guess partway in my journey, I, how I got involved with Imperial Seeds was I, uh, one of the smartest people that I could find that would help me achieve my goals was Kevin Almy, and he worked for Imperial Seeds. So I had a job opportunity for working for a local company and sell, sold seed for them. And then a couple of years later, Imperial Seed offered me a job and I thought, well, this is a better way than, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have to feel bad about bugging them all the time with my questions. So, because uh, one of the important parts is setting a goal and trying to achieve that goal. Um, and if you have the right help to do that, it's 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 a real lifesaver. So, so I took the job simply for the opportunity to help more farmers and speed up my process. And uh, since I've got my job, I've also kind of tried to achieve goals, I guess, that I wouldn't ask other people to achieve. Uh, growing species and stuff that I wouldn't do just because I'd rather experiment on my place than, than give somebody else a headache. So along the way, what I've been doing is old pasture that hasn't been productive. I've taken that out of production and grazed it with annual crops. And even in that, in my second year, I grew a crop that had a lot of biannual species in it. My big learning lesson on that one was that I should have planned on grazing it for two years. I didn't I didn't think that I had enough species in that crop. So um, I left check strips in that and the stuff that I sprayed out probably would have went three bales to the acre on the second year. And that was after being grazed until the middle of June and then finally getting rain after that. So um, just another eye opener and that got me researching things and finding more more species that I could use that I'd used incidentally, I guess. Um, but it taught me the purpose of them species, um, which aren't always fancy. Like the big one in that was just a little bit of red clover, um, which in our country and in your country as well is basically a weed, a lot of guys call it. But mm -hmm. I don't know why you wouldn't grow a weed that produces lots of forage and fixes nitrogen and really solves a lot of our issues. <laughs> um, yeah. So from there, anyway, after a couple of years of a break where I'm just annually grazing that crop, I'll go back in with perennials. Um, and some of the side benefits you see from that just on your perennial pastures by giving, giving them that break. Um, you can use them annual crops to flush your cows to get a quicker breeding season down. And it's, it really opens up the possibilities and it kind of seems expensive for what you get out of it. But when you look at the whole picture of what's happening on your farm, it's really not all that bad. And it's, there's a lot of benefits there. So yeah. And then I started mm -hmm. using them in green feed as well. Uh, simple things like Italian ryegrass, you can add to your oat crop. So you have a living root rate until fall. Um, and it's also very high quality grazing in late in the season. So you're getting weed suppression, fixing some soil issues and building soil structure, feeding that biology and just all for a very minimal cost. Um, but you've got to be careful when you're doing green feed as well, because you can get into, uh, you can cause yourself issues. Brassicas are kind of the rock stars of the cover crop industry and they don't dry down. And I found that out the hard way. <laughs> One of my first cover crops had a lot of brassicas in it and we got a lot of rain mm. that year and they thrived and, you went to reach into that swath to see if it was drying down. It was like grabbing a wet head of lettuce at times in that swath. And it was just, it would, it would have been a great silaging crop, but for a dry bale, I was beating my head on the wall basically. So I had a lot of, a lot of moldy bales that year yeah. that I had to be careful with. And there's a lot of little lessons like that, I guess, along the way that you really need to pay attention to. So. That makes sense. But I guess, yeah, my ultimate goal is on my farm is just to improve my soil structure and and reduce my long-term inputs into the farm. So I might start out fertilizing as heavy as anybody, but I'll always have them check strips in there to see what's going on. Um, and then reduce my inputs accordingly. And it's, it's actually worked quite well. It, it gives you the faith to, to reduce your nitrogen inputs to and not cause a lot of yield, I guess, and see what's going on. And there's times... Where you can't. I've had some fields where I just struggle and struggle, and for some reason I can't get them kicked into gear to do anything. So mm. I'm about to try and go back into a perennial with them with a high legume blend and see what happens with that. But overall, generally, I see pretty good things happening. Right on. And speaking of going back into perennials, there's lots of options out there for like diversity and root diversity, especially uh, with annual forages. But when it comes to perennials, we're a bit more limited, especially up in gray wooded country it feels like so you've mentioned that you've done some experimenting with perennial forages as well can you talk about what you've tried there uh yeah i think we're limited maybe in our species but we're not we're we've always limited ourselves in the past as to what we'll put in a hay stand or a pasture stand 
um like at home our standby has always just been alfalfa and meadow brome on our farm and that's cut and dried that's what you do you don't you know algonquin alfalfa and meadow brome and you're good to go for 10 years <laughs> yeah <laughs> so since i've got into this i've just started adding more actually more varieties of alfalfa into a stand and that actually came from mm. just something i heard on a podcast out of the u.s that said a there's never been a four species of blend of alfalfa that's outproduced a single species blend. Um, and once I heard that, it kind of the light bulbs went off in my head because you got them in different root structures from different alfalfa plants uh, doing different things, different maturities. If you were on a dairy farm and wanted mm -hmm. top quality, perfect stuff, you maybe wouldn't want to do this. But on a, a beef or mixed cattle farm, mixed operation, we're not that picky on when we put our hay up and having that diversity of, of maturity dates can be a good thing. So. I've got one field that's been in that plus sanfoin um, and I think four different species of grasses. And I don't know what's going on out there. I've never tested anything, but it's kind of a magical field as well. It's, I don't know, it's produced better than any other field I've ever had. And it's still mainly alfalfa and barome, but for some reason, I think the extra, elf, or extra grass species in there are really helping. And I don't know why but it mm -hmm. seems like a lot of things in this stuff we don't know why they happen and that's where the, what the research teams are for sure enough yeah and in pasture situations um i've started really loving red clover and alcite clover in light doses in a, in a pasture stand because when you're seeding a new pasture stand down you can get really good ground cover for instance i had one field i seeded in 2021 in the drought and i thought i wasted my money and then this spring it actually looked half decent and then it came around um but then clovers fill up the canopy so fast they basically had zero weed pressure in that field this year um and in that field i also added things because it's a pasture uh so it has red clover alcite clover a little bit of white clover alfalfa chicory plantain sanfoin sicer milk vetch uh Orchard grass, meadow brome, tall fescue, meadow fescue, a little bit of crested wheat grass. <laughs> so uh, just a lot of fun. And you'll see as you go through these fields, the highs and the lows, the different species thrive in different areas. And um, in time, I expect it to kind of mellow out to being that sicer milk vetch, sanfoin, a bit of alfalfa and, and some clover out there with all them grasses. And then the grasses mm -hmm. will kind of fill in best where they want to fill in. So it's a lot of fun. And the, the chicory and the plantain that I mentioned are not real popular species, but chicory is a short-lived perennial that's got a taproot that gets down just like sweet clover. It'll go down six or eight feet. And in my gray wooded soils, I've been able to pull, grab a plant by the base in its second year and pull two feet of root out of concrete like ground. So it's kind of doing magical things in there. And um, according to Clayton Robbins, who's a Nuffield scholar out of Manitoba, um, it's supposed to be one of the best species of feeding biology in your soil early in the year, in year two. So little things like that, when you get into this, kind of make a big difference. It seems to come really early. And it's a high sugar plant. So in year one, it's got a lot of forage value. Um, in year two, it turns into a tall branchy plant uh, that's not real palatable, but my bison have learned to strip the leaves off of it which is becoming another advantage because now right now I've got six to eight foot tall chicory out in my fields catching snow. And it's amazing having scattered chicory out in that field. It's just like little bushes out there that, that it can catch as much snow as it does. So it's kind of got side benefits there as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people would consider that waste, but it's also bringing up all the nutrients from down deep. So it's really, really taking off. Um, and then the plantain as well is uh, another high sugar plant, short lip perennial. Um, it loves compaction and loves low wet spots. So in my sloughs, it's doing really well around the edges of that. It has a nice fibrous root that really breaks up soil as well and gets that water into the ground. So, um, And there were two perennial species that I am using in, a, in annual crops a little bit as well, um, but very cautiously because the chicory can survive through pre-burns the next year it seems like mm. um and i've seen well i've got some nice blue fields in year two that were supposed to be straight oats but <laughs> uh, but i don't end crop spray anymore either so it's a bit of a catch-22 sometimes you have some little things out there that you don't want to see yeah but they do offer a lot of advantages in your system having that living root you know if that chicory lives through the second year and 
breaks up your soil and gets that root down deep and then you do terminate it within the next cash crop you've got them nice root channels going down to get the water to go through the hard pan in your soil and it, it works pretty well uh so one other thing that i've tried with uh, perennial cover crops um which kind of came about by mistake through that two-year trial on a pasture but um is a herbal a which i kind of found out accidentally on twitter what they call them and then researched it um and they use them quite often in the uk uh, so what a herbal lay is the three-year high legume high four grass blend that's easily terminated um, after its term is up sort of thing so what you'll do is grow legumes like in the peace country where you got red clover that thrives um, you would grow that because it thrives but it's also short-lived um, so you'll grow red clover, alcite clover, plantain, chicory as your forbs, um, some sandfoin if you can afford it. It's a little pricey up here, <laughs> but um, and a little bit of alfalfa. Stay away from the vetches because they're too hard to terminate. Slicer mm -hmm. milk vetch, that is. Um, and then throw a mix of grass in there, like orchard grass. That's a very good deep-rooted perennial, but it's generally a shorter-lived one. Um some fescues and other deep rooted grasses in there. And what you do is leave it in for three years and either hay it, silage it, or graze it for that term uh, to fix your soil rapidly. So rather than one of our challenges in Western Canada is we don't have a real long growing season to take full advantage of things. Right. And it's hard to make an annual cover crop, a full season crop pay. And you're going to kind of have limited results and you can end up with some nitrogen tie up if you leave too high a carbon residue on top and stuff. But in this perennial system, you got three years of advantages. And if you've got a system that that can utilize that forage in any which way, um, you're going to fix a lot of soil issues in a hurry and, and fix nitrogen. So in the UK, they do that as a three-year three year perennial. Then it goes to three years of organic crop rotation. And then they go back into a herbal A, which is kind of a genius little system, I think, if you're an organic farmer. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah, and the things I've been seeing with it, like this is this, the pasture I seeded in 21 is basically a herbal lay and it's just lush and beautiful and it's, it, it really changed my soil profile already in year one. So it's pretty, or year two, I guess I seeded it last year, but it's, it's pretty neat to see these things and I'm kind of excited about that one for the future. Yeah, that's awesome. So I know there's a lot of different ideas about how to best utilize cover crops, especially when there's cash crops in the system. And you mentioned that you've tried, you, you've grazed them, you've swath grazed them, you've tried green feeding them and that sort of stuff. Have you tried anything like green manure? Have you done silage stuff with them? What have you tried and what do you like doing? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried green manure uh, simply because I don't till on my farm. I've got some organic customers that do use them as a green manure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think on an organic system too, it's it's as much a green manure as a green fallow period, you could call it, where you can do a short fallow period. And then rather than continuing summer following for the rest of the year, cover that field with with a variety of species that are going to smother the weeds rather than rather than have to till that field again and then you'll have that green plow down for the future or possibly if you got a fairly clean field you can seed right into it and no till it the next year so uh, them sort of things take planning and alternate alternate uh, routes to go I guess but uh, it's nice to have that in your back pocket as an organic farmer and some guys have successfully no tilled into that stuff so um, and as far as silage I don't silage on my farm but I wish I did because when you silage with cover crops, it really the world is your oyster because you can up that feed quality so high. Mm -hmm. um, you won't necessarily get more tons. Generally, you do if it's a drier or a wetter year. On a optimum year, your monocultures will generally yield the same. Um, but just the increase in protein, energy, all around nutritional value and, and what you're feeding is so much greater. And then the regrowth that you can get after is, is fantastic because uh, uh, the brassicas will stay green right into winter under the snow. They'll stay nice. Uh, same as the Italian ryegrass and some other species. So you can get a really nice second flush of growth in there and really increase your production. Mm -hmm. I've got some farmers that don't grow them necessarily for the benefits of the silage crop even, but for that regrowth after, which is really nice to see. But it's yeah. kind of frustrating when you don't do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. But that said, though, when 
uh, next year, I think I may try rather than swath grazing, doing some individually wrapped bales. I've got a neighbor with a wrapper now. Um, mm-hmm. And my thought process there is I can lengthen my growing season. The one part of swath grazing that I don't like is you're wasting 45 days of growing in the beginning of the season because you want to plant it at that optimum time to try and have the best feed when you want to swath it and not get too much fall moisture on it or if that's the scenario. Um, but by wrapping, you could seed it earlier silage it at the right time, leave them bales on the spot, get that good regrowth in the fall, and then just feed them with a hot wire and, and cut that wrap off as you're going through the field. So you're getting all the all of the best of both worlds, basically. Yeah. And I assume with that, you'll get the same with swath grazing of poly crops or cover crops, whichever you want to call them. You use very little mineral with your, with your animals um, versus corn grazing or something else. You just have a good, complete nutritional profile there. Yeah. For instance, the last time I grew corn for grazing was four or five years ago, but I I went from swath grazing and I had 60 pairs out there plus the bulls um, for a month and they used maybe 20 pounds of mineral and salt. And then I put them on corn and in the first week they used 100 pounds and then it backed down to 50 pounds a week after that. So that's just nothing against corn, but it tells me there's something in there that it's lacking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not quite as complete a ration there exactly yeah and that's one of the benefits too like the new off calf programming that's coming out um we can broadcast things into corn and up that nutritional profile with some brassicas in the understory or italian ryegrass um hairy vetch is another thing it's roundup tolerant so you can seed that with your corn mm-hmm. sometimes you'll kill it when you spray it sometimes you won't uh most of the time you won't <laughs> but if I guarantee it, then everybody will kill it. Um, but it really has that nutritional profile for the animals mm-hmm. as well. Um, and with this off-calf funding, and uh, I'm not sure how Alberta's goes, but in Saskatchewan, if we have six inches of growth October 1st, I think we're eligible for a payout. Nice. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to double check. I know our program reopens February 13th, so I should get my uh, <laughs> should get my basic knowledge back up. Yeah, but it's little things like that if they... If the government's willing to pay us to to try these things, and it's a, there's no better time to try them than now because you can reap the war, reap the rewards, and then when the program's done, we should see we should have made the mistakes we need to make and know where to go from there. I guess. There you go. <laughs> so I've recently seen a presentation or two from bison producers who are using cocktails and have cover crops for feed, but a lot of the cover cropping for forage like all the research and stuff is aimed at cattle. So have you had any trouble getting the bison accustomed to the new feeds? Are there any things you have to watch out for as opposed to cattle? Or are they pretty much the same? Uh, pretty much the same. I think if anything, we're really fortunate. Uh, like my pasture example earlier with the heavy red clover and stuff, like that was so rank with legumes that I would have been worried as a beef farmer to put animals out there. But bison were basically bloat resistant, you could say. I've never heard of a bloat case. So I just fired them out there and I did three day moves with them, but it was pretty safe. And on the annual crops as well, I've had no issues at all there. They take to it very well. And there a lot of bison producers will say we can, bison don't need that and they don't need it, but you know, we don't need a five-star meal either. (laughs) (laughs) Once you have one, you kind of want to keep having it. And that like the swath grazing, it seems like just on the calves, when you wean them, you'll get close to a 50 pound weight advantage on a polycrop swath grazing versus feeding them bales and hay or, and giving them as much as they want. Just for some reason, there's something about it that that gives you quite a weight advantage there. And then your your cows get so fat on swath grazing that the, they can be on a pretty good diet for the rest of the winter once you start feeding them. And it, it works out very well. Right on. Yeah. So getting into cover crops and cocktails, especially to fulfill specific goals, can be a little bit tricky. So do you have any tips for uh, people who want to try stuff or test things out? Uh, I think just be careful. Um, (laughs) Finding good mentors or uh, good advice can be a difficult thing, but when you find a good mentor, hang on to them. So um, the big thing, I guess, is to set a goal and then do your best to research it and find out what it takes to meet that goal. Like feeding livestock is easy. Um, there are some things you got to watch out for. You don't want to be real heavy in brassica because brassicas come with grazing warnings. 
um, as do many plants. It's not nothing against brassicas, but you can cause issues in abortions with with the high brassica blend. Alfalfa has warnings too, and we use a lot of that. So don't let that part scare you. So I guess the big thing is to watch the species that do have warnings. Hairy vetch has a warning to it as well. You don't want to graze a straight crop of hairy vetch. Um, but it's very high in protein, an excellent source of feed in the wintertime or an excellent source of feed in the silage crop as well. So the, the challenges are just to be cautious. Do your research. There's several good websites out there. Cotswold Seeds out of the UK is one that I actually really like. It's got the root systems on your plants. Um, all in just hand drawn drawings, but it really puts a good visual together on what you're going to put in your field and helps you with your issues. Green cover seed out of the United States also has a lot of really good resources. Unfortunately, in Canada, we don't have a lot of really good resources for the for the consumer online. Kevin Elmy wrote a good book, Cover Crops Canada, that's a good resource as well. But other than that, just talking to the right people to try and meet your goals. Um, be cautious and keep your goals simple in the beginning. You know, if you've got a salinity issue, uh, just try and tackle it on a few acres and see if you can improve some stuff. And don't give up after one year because you just you don't see the results sometimes in one year. My very first cover crop, I would have called it a, a failure. My first cover crop as a green feed crop, it was a, but the field happened to split. And I had very few species other than my oats out there and it didn't look very good. Well, the oats look good. The other species didn't look good. So I thought, well, that was a waste of money. I shouldn't have done that. And uh, the next year I split my field a different direction and it mm -hmm. was canola and you could see a distinct line where that cover crop was. And the year after that, it was corn and you couldn't quite see the line that well again, but you could see the difference when you actually look for it. And then the following year it was canola, or uh, sorry, it went back to perennials and you could see that line plain as day that year as well. So without it being a specific line in the field, I'd have never thought I gained anything from that. So little things like that, I guess you'd always do your own trials. And like as a grain farmer, if you want to start introducing things and trialing it on a small scale, I would recommend whatever you're comfortable with, but do a strip on a side of a field in a scenario where if you were to go east, west one year, you could go north, south the next year. So you'd have a two year cover crop in one patch, but you'll have them distinct lines that you can look at and see what's going on. So if you're not all that observant, you can still still see if there was a difference there. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense to me. Yeah. But really just finding help, finding good people to to talk to. Conferences are probably the best thing. And if you're a guy that knows a lot about cover crops and you're doing a lot of this stuff, then conferences are still the best place to meet people and to expand your your horizons. That's a lot of times mm -hmm. where the best best connections are made. And this is getting more popular. There's probably not a county in, in Alberta that doesn't have somebody doing this sort of stuff. Might be the guy nobody wants to talk to that stays off by himself, but but we're out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds about right. And your research associations in Alberta are doing great things too now. You guys are very fortunate with your groups that you have. Yeah. We're starting to get lots and lots of cover crop and research up here. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. And I know PCBFA, we've been growing them since... 2016 I think we've been doing alternative annual crop trials yeah just to see what grows in the piece yes yeah. <laughs> are a little bit different than everywhere else you are yeah but most things should do quite well up there still you got the intensive daylight and yeah got advantages as well definitely what about like swath grazing and stuff like that up there is it used very much or is it more of we've got lots of bale grazing up here um yeah but we do run into a lot of trouble with elk yeah, that's what it is. Especially the last <laughs> couple of years where the elk don't have a ton of grazing elsewhere. So they're like, oh, look at all this delectable food for me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's one of the issues. And that's, I don't know if them individually wrapped bales would help cover that scenario. I don't know. They can get pretty aggressive. Yeah. If there's enough good growth around them, they might not. But yeah. 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 It's one of those like, uh, it's like that 3D fencing. Like if there's, if there's something else for them to go eat, then the 3D fencing works great. If there's literally nothing else for them to go eat in 50 miles, then maybe not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why I don't even forage test my feed anymore, because if, if I've got all the deer and the neighbor doesn't have any, then I've got better feed than anybody else anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, you just got to look at the positive sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's the biggest thing you would say you've learned while you were switching from 
uh, conventional, I guess, to cover crops? Oh, the biggest thing I've learned is that I know very little, I think, and had to, and had to forget a lot of what I did know or thought I knew. Um, yeah, there's so much to learn once you get into this, but I think it all comes down to just soil structure in the end and what you can do to build soil structure. Um, if you're, if you're doing that, then you're doing something mm -hmm. right. So you just got to get out there with a shovel and dig around and see what you're doing and try and keep that living root in there. Um, and that, and that living root, I guess, is probably the biggest thing I've learned that it's the most important thing in the beginning. When I started growing some things with my green feed, I wasn't strong enough on the living root and I just wasn't seeing benefits there. Like that two and a half inch rain I'd mentioned the field I went to, it had cover crops on it just as long but it was a full removal system and then I was grazing it in the fall. So I didn't have the ground cover on there and I wasn't taking full advantage of that living root either. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wasn't seeing the benefits. I was seeing some benefits, but I wasn't seeing as many for sure. Right. Yeah. Between that and just don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> everybody has something they can teach us. And once you get into this, then you realize you don't know anything. So everybody's <laughs> got something to teach you for sure. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, yeah. Or be cautious of the guy that does know everything because that's the scariest man in the room. <laughs> he probably doesn't. <laughs> Sounds about right. Oh yeah, just a fun one. What's your favorite annual or perennial plant to grow? Uh, my favorite plant to grow, my friends probably expect me to say chicory, but it scares me a little bit. Uh, no, it maybe is my favorite one to grow, actually. Yeah, it, just with that taproot and its forage qualities. It's got a lot to offer, um, and it gets everybody talking when you got a six-foot plant with blue flowers out in the middle of your field <laughs> at the end of the season there. <laughs> they don't know what to do. And it's one of the most beneficial, too, all around, I think. And it's it's got a great nutritional profile for the animals. Um, it's a nat <clears throat> natural dewormer as well, um, and plantain is as well, I guess. I should have mentioned that as a sand foin, so... It's a great species for that. And I actually haven't dewormed my bison in six years now since I've been doing this, which is a big no-no in the bison world. I wouldn't recommend anybody do that because if we kind of get worm loads that build up naturally without really good management, and then it ends up costing you on your breeding cycles and, and your calf crops. So, right. but I've just, I felt confident talking to enough people and what I'm doing that I've, I've gone ahead and pulled the trigger on that and haven't regretted it since. Cool. Yeah, other than that, for an annual, hairy vetch is probably one of my favorites. It's a biannual, so it's not really fitting that bill, but uh, <laughs> yeah, great nitrogen fixer, great forage, all around great plant. Yeah, when you can grow a, a legume that gets 11 feet long in the fall in a good year, that's pretty amazing. Yep, nothing wrong with that. No, until you go to swath it or something. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I know a couple of people who have to swath it occasionally and they're like, yeah, I love it until I have to do that. And that's not yeah. the time. Yeah. Everything's got a catch. I yeah. Guess. Well, is there anything we've missed that you'd like to mention? I don't think so. I think just for people getting into this, if try and find a mentor group is probably the biggest thing. Try and find some people around you that are doing it. Don't be afraid to reach out to people that are hundreds of miles from you if you happen to be able to find their email address or phone number because they can help you out. That's probably the biggest thing. I've been very fortunate. I've been able to hook up yeah. with a group of people that we meet every Sunday. And uh, at times we hire professionals to speak to us on Sundays just to have really smart people educate us. And it's not always on farming or cover crops, but it's, it's, it's great to be learning and keeping your eyes open to everything. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, you mentioned a couple of resources earlier, which I'll be dropping off. I'll, I'll just drop the links to those in the description of the podcast here. But are there any other resources you'd like to plug, places people can find you if they want more info, any of that sort of stuff? Sure. Yeah, I can be reached uh, through Imperial Seed on our website. I can be found there. Yeah, other than that, like you can do a pretty good YouTube education on this stuff through Nicole Masters, Christine Jones, Jill Clapperton, people like that. Yamili at the Chinook Applied Research Center is a real gem to talk to and is pretty passionate about this stuff. So mm -hmm. that's probably one of the best resources in Western Canada, I think, as well. <laughs> soil health. Yeah, if yeah. you can get a hold of her, she's great. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But yeah, and if you have the chance to listen to Yamili, if you're not pumped up about soil health before, you will be after. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, other than that, not too much I can think of. And I gave you Kevin Elmy's book right. as well, Cover Cropping in Western Canada. Yep. Yeah. And that's a very good resource. It's got a listing of a majority of the species that are carried in Western Canada. Um, kind of a description of how they're used as well, or what their cautions are, what they're good for. Um, and then he's got some stuff on soil health and grazing cover crops and different things in there. And all from a Canadian perspective, which is pretty nice. Perfect. Well, I think that's all I've got. Thank you very much for sitting down and doing this recording with me. I think that's a great episode. Right on. I hope it comes out all right. (laughs) (laughs) Peace Country Beef and Forage Association is a research and extension group based out of Fairview, Alberta. Our mission is to help producers thrive in an agricultural system that is profitable, regenerative, and attractive to future generations. To learn more about what we do and see the results of our research trials or our archive of newsletters and fact sheets, check out our website at peacecountrybeef.ca. Want to get in touch? Have a burning question or a topic suggestion? Send us a message on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Thanks for listening.